Well, good morning. Come on, is anybody excited to be at church today? Anybody? We are glad that you are here. Hey, we're going to take just a moment before we get into the message today, and we get to celebrate something special. Um, I remember this. Uh, we have four kids of our own, um, all the way from about to be 13, all the way down to four, and I remember this significant moment in each one of their lives uh, where we were able to dedicate them to the Lord. And uh, it's, it's such a significant time. It's not a salvation experience for uh, kids. And honestly, really, it's a commitment on behalf of the parents to, to say, I'm going to raise this child uh, to serve God and, and be in church and be in community and those type of things. And so if you are here this morning, and I know we had uh, a few different ones that registered to have your children dedicated, you can go ahead and come on down. And we'll just, we'll just line, I think it's going to be quite a few this morning, so you can just line the front of the platform here. Come on, can we clap for them as they're coming down? If you've got any family, if, if there's any additional family here that wants to be down here for picture's sake and things like that, you can do that as well. But come on, isn't this awesome? Isn't this awesome? You guys get to look out here at all these smiling faces. Come on, smile, somebody. Um, man, this is, this is such an encouraging thing, and I've, if my wife, I'm going to have her uh, come down, and um, Cassie, Cassie and Ashley, they're on our staff, and they're, um, they're working hard today behind the scenes <laughs> with pictures and, and gifts and everything, but I, I just want to say, um, I, I love, I love uh, the idea and the symbolism of dedicating our kids to the Lord, because I remember for us the the significance of making that decision publicly. I think about um, it's not the same as water baptism, but in water baptism you're going public with your faith and basically declaring before you know God and and those that are surrounding and really to the entire world that I'm a believer and I've surrendered my life to Jesus. And in this instance, um, I love this because this is really you guys as parents saying, I'm, gonna, I'm making the decision today to dedicate my children to the Lord, that they're a gift that God has given to me, and I'm going to make the decision to raise them to know Him. And so it's a very significant thing. And so we have, um, we have some gifts for you guys. Cassie's helping us out. Um, we want each one of you to have one of these inside of here. Uh, there is the Jesus Storybook Bible, which uh, we personally love, um, how it tells stories from the Bible on kids' levels. And uh, there's also a little book in there that's called Praying Circles Around Your Kids. And it is a very easy read. It's very thin, not very thick at all. Uh, Mark Batterson is the author of that. If you've read The Circle Maker or Draw the Circle, any of those books, um, he has one that's Praying Circles Around Your Kids. And it gives you direction for um, how we can pray for our kids because they need our prayer. Um, they need they need to to see. I, I don't think there's anything more significant speaking to really all the parents in the room than uh, than us as parents demonstrating and showing our kids what it looks like to serve God, what it looks like to worship and to lift our hands and to spend time in prayer. And uh, I've heard stories of of parents uh, or kids of parents before that. Uh, they would wake up and they would walk out and they would see, you know, their dad's Bible on the table. Or they would walk into the room. Uh, there's a song out that I really like that talks about, you know, your kid would walk into the room and think, oh, you're, you're busy. But they would walk in to see you praying. And it's inviting them in to say, no, you can, you can come join me and let's pray together. It's devotionals with your kids, you know, in the mornings before you go to school or uh, in the evenings as a family, you know, before you, before you go to bed. Those things, a lot of times we take them for granted, and we don't think they're having the significant impact that they really are in our kids' lives. And so um, we're, we just we honor you as parents for making the decision to, to say, we're going to raise our kids to know God and uh, to serve Him and love Him. And so uh, we also have a certificate that we're going to give you for each one, of the, each one of the kids. And as Cassie's doing that, I'm going to ask, do you have anything that you want to you wanna share? You don't I have think, to. I think it's just <laughs> I think it's good to remember even as parents and speaking specifically to those here that um, that this is our community and why church is one of the re one of the many reasons why it's so important that you have people around you that love God. But I know for me when we chose to do this as a family, 
it always reminds me that God cares about my kids even more than I do. And, and that I can trust him with their heart and trust him to lead me as lead us as we lead them. So I think I just want to remind you as parents that Holy Spirit will lead you to lead your kids. Yeah. Will you do this with us? Will you stretch your hand this way? And we want to pray over them, pray over these families, pray over these, pr- these parents, pray over these, these kids. And uh, just pray that God's going to give you wisdom and knowledge in how to raise them and what to do and what decisions to make. Come on, there's going to be a lot of decisions as they grow up and, and get older and seasons change and things like that. So uh, let's do that. Let's, let's pray over them. If you'll join with me and let's just, uh, let's just speak blessing over them and ask God to give them wisdom. Lord, we thank you today for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity to have this significant moment in time uh, on this day to where we have made the decision as parents to to. Re- to offer our kids to you and say, you know what, this is a child that is a gift from you. And Lord, they are placed in my care so that I can train them and I can love them and I can teach them to love you and teach them about you and teach them to serve you. And so Lord, we just thank you for every single one of these families that are represented here today and even extended family that is in the Uh, the congregation today. Lord, we thank you that you are blessing them, that your favor is on them. Give them wisdom to know what to do in seasons and in times when they need it. Lord, help them to stay close to you, to stay in your word, to teach their kids to be in your word. And we thank you. And Lord, we just dedicate these children to you. We make the decision that we we will love you as a family and we will serve you with all that we have. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on. And everybody said... Amen and amen. Come on, can we give them a hand again as they go back to their seats? <laughs> amen. I want to make mention of one thing before we get into the message today. Uh, tonight through Wednesday night, there's an event at the Civic Center. You heard us talking about this last week. It's called Nights of Refreshing. And uh, I would encourage you, if you have a, an evening to where you can slip over there and be a part of that, I would encourage you to do that. Churches coming together uh, for one cause, lift up the name of Jesus. And so if you're available um, to be able to do that, then we would love for you to participate in that, be a part of what God is doing in our community. Uh, We believe that, that this is not just about our church, that it's about the capital C church and about the kingdom of God. And uh, we love opportunities in our community where we can join together and serve God together and worship together and grow in the word together. So um, this month, many of you, if you're a part of our church, you know that we have called uh, this month, May We Pray. This is the first time that we've uh, done this, and we just really felt like the Lord was leading us this year to put more of an emphasis on prayer, and really from this point moving forward. Because at the beginning of every year, we always have 21 days of prayer and fasting, and uh, we fast and we pray and we seek God at the beginning of the year. We give God our best at the beginning of the year. Uh, But then, how many of you know that sometimes, you know, as you go through the year, uh, sometimes we just need to refocus. Sometimes there needs to be a a coming back together and coming back to uh, what really matters and just being reminded. Sometimes we get so busy in life, and I know we're about to head into the summer season where things seem to get crazy, and we're on vacations, and kids are out of school, and, you know, by the first week of August, all the parents are like, when does school start again? And, you know, all of these things that, that happen over the next few months. And we don't want to lose the the heart of what it is that God's called us to do. So we've been doing a thing called May We Pray on Tuesday nights. We're gathering here at 6 o'clock from 6 to 7. And we're praying together as a church family. And uh, it's been awesome the first two weeks that we've done this. I want to invite you to come out this Tuesday from 6 to 7. Even if you have to get here a little late because of work or something going on, you have to leave a little early, that's fine. Uh, It's not this super, super formal thing. We do give some direction and and uh, we have a prayer topic that we're praying over every single week. And so uh, we want you to be here because prayer is, is vitally important. And then next Sunday night, uh, we're going to have uh, a time where we're going to get together next Sunday night from 6 to 7 uh, for a night of worship and prayer. And so it's going to be specific, specifically geared toward what we're doing during the month of May. And just having an opportunity next Sunday night where we can join together in this room and lift up the name of Jesus, have time to be prayed for, and pray with others, and things like that. And so we want you to be here next Sunday night as well. But uh, since we're putting an overall focus on prayer for the month of May, um, I felt like it was appropriate right here as we sit in the month of May, as I've been praying over the last few weeks, and, and, uh, and, and just seeking direction with God, where do you want to take our church, and what do you want to do, and 
what do you want to teach us and, and where do you want us to go and how do you want us to move forward? Uh, I think there are a few different things that God's put on my heart that I'll probably be speaking on, not specifically in a series, but just kind of in these standalone messages over the next few weeks. And today I want to start with, with the subject of prayer. Um, I think that we all would probably say that we're on uh, different, we're in different seasons of life with prayer, different even, um, if we could say this, levels of intimacy with our Heavenly Father in the area of prayer. I think that there are some of us in here that my hope and my prayer for you is that uh, this week and this month and as you move forward in your life, that you would take another step into, uh, into a deeper prayer life. That you would take another step. If you've never been a person that today you would say, I've, I've never really been a person that has spent a whole lot of time praying. Maybe for you that step is for you to begin to form a prayer life. Maybe you're somebody who prays semi-regularly or something like that and God's calling you to something higher and something deeper. And so he's asking you to take another step into deeper intimacy with him. But I want to talk to you today on the subject of prayer. And I've simply titled this message, um, if you're taking notes, Teach Us to Pray. Teach us to pray. Um, one thing that I have discovered is that as I was seeking God on what to say on this topic of prayer, um, has anybody ever tried to explain prayer to somebody? Has anybody ever had anybody ask you, like, what does it mean when you pray? And you were like, you know, I've just got the perfect answer for what it means when I pray, right? Like, this seems like it's one of those topics where it's almost hard to explain, it's almost difficult to, to help somebody understand why you do what you do or how you pray or the importance of prayer. It's really one of those things that you, you almost don't grasp the necessity of it and the importance of it until you actually begin to do it. And so I, I want to look at a passage of scripture and then we're going to look at several verses and and uh, kind of make some points and pull some things out of this story uh, that's in the Bible. But I, my hope and my prayer is that you would take a step. That you would better understand something in the area of prayer. That God would speak to your heart and your mind specifically in some way in one of these areas today. So I want to start, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11. And I want to read verses 1 through 13. And then I want to pull four things out of this today. Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1, says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation." Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. I've been reading and studying quite a bit over the last few weeks as we entered into the month of May because even for me personally, as we go through May, we pray and we put an emphasis on prayer. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to better understand prayer. And I, and I had felt like the Lord was leading me to even speak on this topic. And so I was asking God, what what would you have me to say on the area of prayer? Because we can go a hundred different directions as we talk about prayer. I think there are really four things. They're all going to start with the letter P. Come on, somebody, so it can help you remember it. Um, but I think there are four things I want to pull out of just these 13 verses that hopefully you're going to be able to grasp onto something that's going to help you take another step in your prayer life. Because we need a prayer life. We need that connection with our Heavenly Father. 
We need to make prayer, here's point number one, a priority. Priority. We have to start here. Because if prayer is not a priority to you, nothing else that I'm about to say will really matter. Prayer has to be a priority in your life. Um, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we just read this, but it says, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now I want to pause here for just a moment. Some of us just need a certain place. It says, one day Jesus was off and he was praying in a certain place. I just want to get very practical before, and this isn't even in my notes, it's just kind of hit me this morning that maybe there was somebody here who was struggling in this area. Maybe you just need a certain place. And the first step for you is going to be like, that is, come on, my prayer chair. That is the place that when I get up in the morning, I go sit there, and that's where I take a moment to pray before I start my day. Maybe you need, you need like an area in your room, or maybe you're, if you're like me, um, a lot of times I, I have better conversation, and, uh, and, and things come to my mind even in prayer as I'm walking. And so even on like Tuesday night prayer nights, I'm like warning everybody every single week because there are some of us, we just like to like walk the room while we pray. Because as I'm walking around, the Lord is, you know, like speaking things to me or things will come to my mind or I'll, you know, have this idea. It's like the Lord saying, you need to pray for that or, or, you know, pray for that person in that moment or something like that. But I think that, I think we need to take a lesson from Jesus and have like a certain place. A place that when we come home, you know, or before we go to bed, or when we get up in the morning, that we go to that place, and it's like, this is where I'm going to pray. This is going to be my prayer spot, right? I remember this, and before we moved um, out of town a little bit, the house we were living in before had one of those windows that you could sit in, and I remember that was like in the morning time. I actually like to go over there, and the sunlight would be coming in and sit in that window. I don't know what it is for you, but find, I would encourage you to find some place to where you know, like, I'm going to go right there, and that's where I'm going to meet with God. And I don't think there's any significance in like God, like God is going to come right there because he knows that's where you're coming. I think it's just more intentional for us. That we know, no, this is what, this is what I've set my mind to do. And I'm going to sit down right here. I'm going to kneel right here. I'm going to walk right here. I'm going to do whatever it is in this certain place so that I can pray. So one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, I don't know if you've ever witnessed somebody uh, that had some kind of consistent habit in their life. It could be good, could be bad, but you can probably think of somebody whenever you think about uh, a certain person, you think, wow, that person is like super successful because of this, because of the habits that they form, because of the things that they've done consistently over time. And sometimes we look in on people's lives and we think, wow, I want to be like them. I want to have the same experience they have. I want to have the same favor that they do. I want to have the same connection with God that they seem to have. I want to have, and you're seeing the effects of things and decisions that have been made behind the scenes. And I think this is what the disciples were experiencing. I think that they were looking in on Jesus as Jesus is, you know, he said, follow me. And they're following him and they're doing ministry and they're seeing people healed and they're seeing ultimately Jesus getting away to pray. And so they wake up in the morning and Jesus is not there and like, oh, we better go look for Jesus. You know, where do they find him? Praying. You know, even when crowds were gathering around, Jesus would slip away and he would pray. One time he sent the disciples off in the boat and said, hey, go to the other side of the lake, like start heading that way, and Jesus went off to pray. Jesus was constantly getting away to pray, and I think the disciples had been witnessing this over time. These are just some references from the Gospel of Luke, since we're in Luke today. Luke 3, 21 and 22 says, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but Jesus is baptized. All of these people are around. It says that as everybody else was being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And Jesus, you know, this is the instance where John is reluctant to baptize Jesus. And he says, if anybody needs to be baptized, it's me by you. And, he, and Jesus says, no, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to be about the will of the Father. And this is what he is asking us to do. So John baptizes him. And I picture this as he comes up out of the water, he's praying. And it says, as he was praying, 
the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son. I love him and I am well pleased with him. And Jesus, even at his baptism, he comes up. And I picture this. He comes up out of the water and he's praying. And everybody's around and they're like, wow. What, what is he doing? And they're witnessing these things that are happening. Luke 5, 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This was an instance where Jesus had just been crowded by all of these people around him, right? There are people pulling at Jesus. They're asking things of Jesus. They're crowding around Jesus. And the craziness of circumstances is on a high level. But the craziness of circumstances did not keep Jesus from making time to pray. And it says, in the midst of this, like he, is, he has taught all these people, there's been healing happening, like all of these people are crowded around, and then it says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Luke 6, 12, one of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now why is this one significant? In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, we see that Jesus went out, to the mountainside, and he prayed, and he spent all night praying to God. You know what Jesus did after he spent all night praying to God? Chose his disciples. So Jesus didn't go picking people and then ask the, the Father, was this okay? He spent all night in prayer, knowing that there were decisions that had to be made, knowing what he was here to accomplish and that he was going to select some people and they were going to follow him and he was going to teach them all of the things that the Heavenly Father wanted him to teach them and they were going to experience all of this stuff so that they could then start the church after he was gone and Jesus knows all of this and before he goes and decides and picks these people, he spends the whole night in prayer. And it got me thinking, I wonder... How many of us just make decisions without praying? How many of us just do the next thing without spending any time in prayer? Jesus set an example for us. This is Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. It says, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. I find it ironic because the disciples in Luke 11, they said, Jesus Teach us, teach us how to pray. While all along, they had been alongside him and witnessed him praying. But here's what I think the disciples were noticing. They, I think the disciples were connecting the dots. And I think they were connecting the dots and they were seeing all of these people were healed. Prayer. All of these people are crowding around Jesus and asking something of him constantly, and he never seems to get aggravated with them. Prayer. Jesus was even choosing people. How did he even know who to choose whenever he was picking us? Prayer. And I think they were connecting the dots like we're seeing healing, and Jesus is constantly getting away to pray. And then we're, we're seeing he's making all of the right decisions. And he was constantly getting away to pray. Like, we got up this morning to go look for him, and we found him praying. And now we're here doing this? Like, there were 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, and they were all fed. Maybe it has something to do with all of the time that Jesus has been praying and so the disciples come to this point to where they don't ask jesus well how can we how can we preach better they didn't ask him that they didn't ask jesus well how can we do greater things how can we listen they didn't ask jesus how can we draw a crowd because everywhere you go you seem to draw a crowd so how can we draw? They didn't ask Jesus, well, how can we get more people to like us? How can we get more people on our team? How can we get more people to stop, you know, resisting what it is we're trying to do? They didn't ask him any of that. And you know why I think it was? This is just my personal opinion. I think it was because they had started connecting the dots. And they were thinking, 
I think all of this comes back to all of the times where we can't find him because he's praying. And after the crowds go away, Jesus slips away and he prays. And before he makes decisions, he's praying. And when he's got people gathered around and he wants people to know that they can have a relationship with their Heavenly Father, he takes a moment and he prays. And so they stop and they're like, okay, we've just seen Jesus has just been praying in a certain place. And when he finished praying, one of the disciples, I think that the disciples were probably like, you ask him, you know, like, you be the one. We all kind of want to know, but you be the one to go ask him. And so one of the disciples comes and asks Jesus and they say, hey, John has taught his disciples how to pray. We want you to teach us how to pray. We want you to teach us what it looks like to pray. Jesus even referred to the temple as a house of prayer. Matthew 21, 13, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The disciples went to the temple specifically to pray. If you read through the book of Acts and when the church begins, there were set aside times where the Bible says that they were on their way at this certain time to go to the temple for the prayer meeting. Like, we've got to get to where Jesus said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, and we're going to the prayer meeting. One of them is, is I love this, Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. I think that, I think that the disciples knew and the first church knew, listen, that they needed God. And here is my concern for us in the, the culture that we live in, is that do we really feel like all the time, do you wake up in the morning and you just know, I have to have God today? Because we have our own vehicles to get us where we need to go. And we have some money in the bank from all the hard work that we've done. And we have people around us that we like to hang out with and we like to do life with. And we get so distracted by things around us that I think sometimes, if I could submit this to you, I think sometimes we don't feel like we need him. And because we don't feel like we need him, prayer then becomes... A non-priority. Until an emergency. And so prayer has to be a priority. And I think the first church and the disciples, all the instances we read where they gathered together and they prayed, it was because I think that they were constantly looking at each other like, we have to have the power of God. We have to have God backing this we have to have god going before us we have to know that god is for what we're doing prayer should be a priority in our lives i think we ask the lord for a lot of things because we value those things but i wonder if we don't think to ask the lord to help us in the area of prayer in our lives because we may not value it as much and i wonder how many times we've made decisions that we wouldn't have made if we had prayed first wonder how many times we've missed what God wanted to do through a situation because we didn't pray first. Or I wonder how many times we've had an incorrect perspective on something because we didn't pray first. And prayer should be our first response, not an afterthought. Oh, that we would be people that, that in the midst of anything in life, our first response would be to pray. Not allowing things to get to a certain point before we begin to think about praying but that our first response would be prayer. I love this story. This is in Acts chapter 4. And Peter and John, they've faced a difficult circumstance, right? They've, you know, they've, they've been on trial. They've been threatened. Um, basically, you need to go back and tell everybody, y'all need to stop doing what you're doing. Stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Stop talking about Jesus. Stop preaching this gospel that you claim to be true. Stop it. And Peter and John, they go back to the other believers and this is what we see. It says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they go back and they tell everybody, this is what was said to us, this is what we went through, this is what they're telling us to do and telling us to stop doing and all of this. And look, and when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. The, <laughs> I, I picture this in my mind. This is just how my mind works sometimes. It's like, you know, they've been going through 
this, this persecution and the, the religious leaders and all of these people around there trying to shut down this movement, the Jesus movement, and them talking about the resurrection, and them talking about Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, and they're telling them to stop it, and the disciples, Peter and John, go back to the other believers, and they explain to them what's going on, and the other believers didn't go tell Susie, like, whew, did you hear what, did you hear what the religious leader said? You know, you might, need, you might need to be careful, Susie. You might need to be careful because, you know, they're, they're against us. Like, their first initial response wasn't fear. It wasn't worry. It wasn't to, to let everybody know. Their initial response was, wow, that's what they're saying? We need to pray. And not only did they pray, the Bible would tell us that they prayed for boldness to keep doing what they had already been doing said, Lord, we need you to be with us. This is what we're facing. We're facing opposition, and we need you. And so we're going to pray in this moment. John the Baptist, he was referenced in verse 1. He was a person of prayer. He taught his followers how to pray. And the fact that Jesus had to pray while he was ministering here on earth is proof enough to me that I need to pray. If Jesus, the Son of God... The invisible God made visible. Took time to pray and needed to pray and needed connection with his heavenly father in that way. How much more do you and I need it? Prayer needs to be a priority. So I think we need to ask ourselves this question. Is prayer a priority in my life? And here's, and here's the thing. If your answer to this question is, I'm really not a person that prays very much, don't feel condemned, because here's what the enemy would do. He would condemn you, make you feel terrible about how you've just been a horrible person for the last 30 years, I haven't made prayer a priority, and then you'll never, ever start praying because you'll just condemn yourself and you'll be condemned by him. That's not the way that God works. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. If you ask yourself that question today, is prayer a priority in my life? And you would say, man, I need to make prayer. It has not been a priority in my life. Here's what you need to do. Make a change. Here's what God says. Just, just turn around and start going the other way. I haven't made it a priority. You know what I'm going to do on Monday morning? I'm going to take a step. I'm going to take a step. When I get home today from church, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a step. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my place. Where am I going to get up tomorrow morning and just go sit for five minutes or 20 minutes or however long that is for you and get alone with God before I start my day? You don't have to feel condemned. You don't have to beat yourself up about anything. God does not operate that way. He just wants you to follow what he's asked you to do. Make prayer a priority. We need it in our lives. Here's point number two. It's pattern. Pattern. Look at verses two through four in Luke 11. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And we see this same instruction in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. This is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, where it says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also have forgiven our debtors. Or forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I want to talk about just some, just some practical things that I see personally in this that I want to share with you. But the first thing is I notice in Jesus' instruction that in all of the terminology he used, it was always us. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. So I think there is, and Jesus also taught about personal prayer, right? There's another place in the Bible where Jesus is saying, you know what you need to do? Don't be like the hypocrites. You need to go in your closet, close the door, and pray to your Father in heaven who hears and sees everything that is done in secret. So there's a time for us to get alone and get in our prayer closet, if you will, if we can use that terminology, and pray. There's a time for you to have a certain place. Jesus demonstrated it where he got alone and he prayed. But I think there's also a time to pray together. And that's what I love so much about what we're doing this month on Tuesday evenings where we have an opportunity to come together and pray. Come together and worship and pray and seek God about specific topics and specific areas in our lives. 
Uh, also, I was, as I was reading this, I remember um, when I was in high school, I played, well, all through, all through school I played sports, but I remember specifically in high school in basketball. And before every single game, right, so this is, and this is public school, go figure, um, before every single game, we would circle up in the locker room and we would recite the Lord's Prayer. And then we would go out and play. We would gather in the locker room and we would recite the Lord's Prayer. And I don't think there's anything wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer. And a lot of us in this room have probably been taught to recite the Lord's Prayer. You've probably recited the Lord's Prayer when you were in church as a little kid and you were in Sunday school, you recited the Lord's Prayer. You've been taught to recite the Lord's Prayer and that is fine. There is nothing wrong with it. That is a beautiful prayer for you to recite and for you to pray. But I also think it's a pattern. Not just something that we're to recite word for word, but also a pattern for how we're to live our lives. And when we spend time in our own personal prayer lives, it's a pattern that I think we can see. And so what is the pattern that Jesus is getting at? I think, uh, just really quickly, I'm going to run through these, but five things that I notice when I read these few verses. I notice relationship, honor, alignment, that it's daily, and request. Relationship, honor, alignment, daily request. Let's talk about each one of these for just a moment as we're talking about a pattern that Jesus has given us. I, relationship is the first one. How many of you know that it's only by relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ that we can refer to God as our Heavenly Father? And Jesus starts the prayer off by saying, Father. Father. Here's how you should pray, Father. In other words, you know what this means to me? You're going to have to have a personal relationship. He's saying, first of all, you need to make sure there's a personal relationship there so that you are referring to God as your heavenly Father. The pattern begins, I believe, with us knowing God as our heavenly Father. Here's the second word, honor. We see honor for his name and honor for the name above all names. He says, hallowed be your name. And I was looking this up. Um, hallowed, maybe you know this, it means sacred, greatly revered, and honored. I think there needs to be a desire on the inside of us that above all else, before, before I'm asking for anything, before I'm doing anything, before I'm bringing my requests or asking for anything provision-wise, like, hey, you know what? Above all else, I am honoring you. I honor your name. I honor your holiness. You are worthy. You are faithful. You alone are good. I am honoring you. The next one that we see is alignment. Alignment. We've talked about this a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, I believe, on our, in our prayer nights when I've shared just at the very end that we align ourselves and our will with God's will. Um, he says, your kingdom come and your will be done. And prayer isn't about me getting my way, but it's about God's will being accomplished. And God wants to use me to accomplish it. And so when I pray, I'm aligning myself with what it is that God has, has created me to do, what his will is for my life. Prayer is not about getting my way. I want to talk about this for just a moment because I think there are some of us, chances are in a room this size, there is somebody here that you, um, you have prayed and you didn't get your way and so you stopped praying. You have prayed and you felt like God didn't answer your prayer, you didn't get what you wanted, and so you have stopped praying. And you've even begun, you've even begun to think, does prayer work? Does God even hear my prayers? Is God even listening? Does God even care? Listen, prayer is not about me asking for things and everything that I ask God for and everything that I desire and everything that I want in my life that God just needs to give it to me. Some of us need to be thankful that God has not given us everything that we have asked for in our lives because he knows above all else there are some things if i gave it to you what you think would be a blessing would actually become a burden what you think you want would actually make you so dependent on that thing that i gave you that you would forget about me and so because i know that you would forget about me and you would begin to worship that instead of worshiping me right now i can't give that to you because it would actually hurt you more than it would help you it reminds me of when God was providing for the children of Israel there were certain things that God knew if I gave you that 
if I just sat you in this place, if I just took care of all of your problems immediately, come on, we see this in the children of Israel, they, they would get a blessing, and then they would turn to the blessing, they would begin to worship that. They would turn away from God. Come on, this is the whole, this is the whole story of the Old Testament. God's people, and he delivers them, and he sets them free, and they walk right back into bondage and start wa- worshiping other gods. And then in his grace and in his mercy and in his forgiveness, he, he forgives them and he restores them, and then they walk into something else. Come on, prayer is about us aligning our will with God's will. The Greek word, look at this, the Greek word that we translate as pray or prayer in the Bible This is what it means. In the original language, this is what prayer means. To interact with the Lord by switching human wishes or ideas for his wishes as he imparts faith. Prayer is a picture of me taking my ideas and my wishes to God and exchanging them for what it is that is his desire for me. And our hope and our goal is that our prayer life would become one where we are now praying for the things that God desires for us. That we're not praying contrary to what God's purpose is. We're praying with what God's purpose is. That we have the heart of God and his thoughts and his compassion for people. And now we're praying for the things that God desires in our lives. Here's the next word. It's daily. Jesus says to ask for what we need for that day. He says, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Another thing, if you read through the Old Testament, you read when the, the Israelites were brought out of slavery and, and God is providing for them and he provides just what they need for that day. And then the next day they get up and he has exactly what they need for that day. And then the next day they get up and they have exactly what they need for that day. I love the scripture in Psalms where it talks about how your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And what most of us would want was we would want that to say, your word is a beam of light that shows me a mile and a half down the road in every area and every crack and every crevice and behind every tree so that I can know what's coming and I can avoid all of it. But that's not what it says. It's taking one step at a time as we follow Jesus. And in this prayer, Jesus is saying, you know what you need to do? Ask to give us today our daily bread. Give us what we need to feed on today. Give us the provision that we need for today. Sometimes we want more provision or more understanding or more direction, but God knows what we need, and we just need to come to him each day to ask him for what we need for that day. And then the last word that I see in here is requests. And that's at the very end where he, he says, forgive us and lead us, you know, forgive us for what we've done, and lead us not into temptation or you know, we can even, I believe that we can even expound upon that because, because I think it's a picture, it's a pattern in our prayer lives. And I was even thinking about some things like forgiving us for what we've done, lead us in the future, direct our steps, show me how to love that person, come on somebody, show me how to serve my spouse today, lead us in this decision that we have to make this week because it's a life-altering decision. Like, this is what God wants to do for you. This is what prayer is about. It's, it's, it's how can I get God's will for my life inside of me so that he can lead me and I'm willing to follow him and not just follow my own way. And Jesus has provided this great pattern for prayer. It begins with a personal relationship with him. Above all else, we honor him and desire his will. We allow him to align our will and desires with his will and desires. We seek his provision daily. We bring our specific requests to him. And then here's point number three. What I see in what Jesus was teaching is persistence. Persistence. Priority, pattern, and persistence. Look at verses five through eight. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I I don't believe, um, so I have have read this before, and, and I have thought one way about it, and I feel like the Lord is changing my perspective on these verses, uh, on persistence. And here's the reason why. I don't believe that Jesus is, is putting God in the same boat as this grouchy neighbor. Because a lot of us have viewed it that way, and God is a grouchy neighbor. And we go to knocking, and we're like, God, this is what I need in my life. And God's like, I'm in bed. 
I can't get, my kids are already asleep. I cannot give you what you need. Like, come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. I don't think it's a picture of God being like this grouchy neighbor that if you just keep on and keep on and keep on, then finally God's going to get sick of hearing your voice and just give you what you want. I don't think it's a picture of that. I think Jesus is, is giving us this picture of persistence in prayer, but I believe that we are intended to look at this story from a different perspective. That if persistence with this friend or this neighbor continually knocking, this reluctant neighbor, the neighbor that said, my kids are in bed and I'm in bed and come back tomorrow and I don't have time to deal with this right now. If persistence with this person got that person what they were needing, how much more will persistence, and we're going to look at this in, in more detail in just a moment, will persistence with your heavenly father who loves you and wants to take care of you, how much more will persistence with him bring blessing into your life and align your will with his will? It's not that God is, is, is grouchy with you. God loves you, and he knows what's best for you. But I think Jesus is teaching us that there's something to being persistent. God wants to meet your needs in such a way that it brings glory to him. Persistence in prayer. I love this. Philip Brooks, he said it this way. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his highest willingness. Persistence in prayer is not an attempt to change God's mind, but to get ourselves to the place where he can trust us with the answer. Prayer is not about me trying to get God to change his mind. Like, God, do you not see that this is what I'm dealing with? Yeah, he sees. Prayer is getting me to the position to where God can trust me with the answer that he wants to entrust me with. God can trust me with the, with the provision that he wants to trust me with. God can trust me with the answer to my prayer that I've been praying because now he has developed the character in me and I have, I have over time been aligning my will with his will and it's no longer about, come on, James tell us, tells us that we ask and we don't receive because we ask with the wrong motive. And God is trying to get us to the place where I want you to have my thoughts and my will and my desire so that when you pray, you're praying my will and you can truly say your kingdom come and your will be done, not mine. It's about getting us to a place where God can trust us with the answer to our prayers. And then here's the last one, point number four is promises. The last few verses that we read, verses 9 through 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if, you ask, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I've mentioned this before. This is one of my favorite verses uh, because there's a promise in here. There's a promise in here, but I feel like the Lord is showing me some different things about these verses. One of the things, and I've mentioned this before, is the original tense of these verbs could be better translated as keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Not like an ask once, seek once. Like I asked once and I sought once and I knocked once. It's a, it's a continual thing. And it kind of tags on to this idea of persistence. But many of us have a tendency to ask and seek and knock only in emergencies. And so we claim this verse when we're in the middle of something. And so whenever we're struggling with something, whenever there's something right in front of us and we have a decision to make and we have something like drastic going on in our lives, there's like an emergency in our lives, we're like, ask and you'll receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. God, why am I not receiving? Why am I not finding? And why is this door not being open? Because I'm asking and seeking and I need you now. And God, God will answer those kinds of prayers. God hears you when you're in your moment of need. But I think this is a beautiful picture of us being in not, a, not a, an emergency prayer, but an intimacy with God prayer. And I think Jesus is, is saying in some regards in this verse that here's, here's what your heavenly father desires. That you keep asking and you keep seeking and you keep knocking. 
And you wake up tomorrow, and you know, you know what? I'm going to ask, and I'm going to seek him, and I'm going to knock, and I'm going to trust him that he's going to open the right doors. I'm going to trust him that I'm going to receive what I'm supposed to receive. I'm going to trust him that I'm going to find him when I seek him. It's about relationship with our Heavenly Father. It's about being persistent in our prayers. One uh, verse, I want to read three verses, but, but I love the one in the middle. And we could do an entire series just on these three verses, but uh, this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. He, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know what God's will for you in Christ Jesus is? That you would pray continually. That you would rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. And Paul tells us that part of the will of God for us who are believers or Christians is that we would keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking, that we would pray continually. And God promises that we will receive and we will find and doors will be opened. I want to bring the worship team back. One theologian says this, he makes this statement, as we pray, God will either answer or show us why he cannot answer. Then it is up to us to do whatever is necessary in our lives so that, so that the Father can trust us with the answer. When we pray, God is either going to answer or maybe he's trying to get us to the place where we will align ourselves with him and he can trust us with the answer. You need prayer. The first church prayed constantly they were getting together we got time set aside for prayer we need to get together because something's going on in somebody's life and we need to pray like you can read colossians i believe it's chapter four and verse two says devote yourselves to prayer devote yourselves to prayer we talked about this last year our word was devoted for the year as a church and we talked about devoting ourselves to prayer that we're called to be devoted and i love that we have these promises that how Jesus ends this specific teaching with his disciples because he makes the point to put an emphasis. Listen, don't miss this. He puts an emphasis on how good God is. And he says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your heavenly Father, who loves you, give good gifts to you and specifically as we read it in Luke give you the Holy Spirit which is the greatest gift that God could ever give you the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth who gives you power to live this life out how he, Jesus is saying at the end of this they teach us how to pray and he goes through all of these things and at the very end he says here's what you need to know your heavenly father is so good and if you can even imagine what it would be like for you as a father being evil, not having the, the thoughts of God or the ways of God or sometimes going our own way or, you know, seeking our own, you know, agenda. If you, being in the state that you're in, would not give your kids something that, they, that would harm them that they didn't ask for you know how to give good gifts to your kids in that way, then how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to you and give you the Holy Spirit to live and reside inside of you? And look at this. This is Romans chapter 8. Can we put that on the screen? Look at this. is This is a, a beautiful example of the Holy Spirit through prayer. We know verse 28, but I don't know if you've ever read what's right before it. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Come on, anybody ever been there? I don't even know how to align my will with God's. I don't even know what to pray for in this situation. I don't know, I don't know what God's trying to do in my life right now. I'm not even sure. Come on, some of us, even in, even in difficult situations, we have stopped and we're like, I don't even know what to pray right now. And it says, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people come on are you thankful for that in accordance with the will of God and we know 
Come on, here it is again, the goodness of God. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Why is it so significant that Jesus would say, you know what, your heavenly father is so good that you, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more will he give you good gifts and particularly the Holy Spirit to reside in you the one who, when you don't know what to pray for, will pray through you and will pray for you and will give you the words. And here, and the Holy Spirit knows the will of God. He knows the will of God. And He will lead you and He will lead me to pray the will of God. Will you stand to your feet today? I want to end with just a simple encouragement. And I don't know, I don't know where you're at in your in your prayer life. Maybe today you just need to take a step in that direction. And I'm gonna to begin to pray. I'm gonna to begin to seek God in this way. Maybe you maybe you are somebody who prays. And today God is taking you into something deeper. God is asking you to take another step. Like I wanna. I want to I want to help you pray my will. Like you know you you're intentional to pray, but I want to give you my heart and I want to I want to give you things to pray for. I want to I want to put people on your heart and on your mind that you can pray for specifically. And God's taking you to a new level in your prayer life. I don't know I don't know where you are at when it comes to enhancing if you will your prayer life. But I want to encourage you with this. Because our heavenly Father knows us and loves us. We don't have to be afraid of what his answer will be. And here's what I felt like as I was preparing for this today. Here's what I felt like the Lord put on my heart. Is that there may just be one person in this room. But you've stopped praying because you're afraid of what God's going to tell you to do. And here's what I would say to you. You don't have to be afraid of what God's answer will be. Because if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to you? And God knows what you need. He knows what your purpose is. He knows what He's called you to. He knows what He has for your life. And so because your Heavenly Father loves you so much, You don't have to worry about what God's response will be because God's response will always be what's best for you because he wants to work through you so that he can get glory and that the people around you will see him in you and they will worship him. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I believe there's somebody here today, God's calling you back to prayer. And you've just been afraid of what God's going to, is God going to tell me to do that? Is God going to move me? Is God going to going to, going to send me over here? Is God going to tell me to do something crazy? No, God, God loves you and you don't have to be afraid of what his answer will be when you seek his heart and you seek his will. And that's good news today. Come on, will you bow your heads? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you that you know what we need even before we ask. You know where every person is at in this room. You know their desires. You know their struggles. You know what's going on in their life right now. Maybe what they have been asking you for. And Lord... I know that I have done the best that I could do with what I feel like you gave me to share. But Holy Spirit, you are so much better at this than me. So I'm asking you to speak to every person's heart today. Lord, that you would bring peace where there's no peace. You would bring hope where there's no hope. Lord, those that have walked away from prayer because they're afraid of what you might say, Lord, they're coming back to prayer today. Those, those that have walked away because 
They've been disappointed because they didn't get what they wanted. Lord, I thank you that you're aligning our heart with your heart, our will with your will. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Lord, let us be people of prayer. And Holy Spirit, I pray that if there's any person in this room today who needs to receive prayer for anything in their life, maybe they're walking through a difficult situation, they've got a decision to make, and they just want somebody to agree with them. As we sing this last song, Holy Spirit, I pray you would draw every person today who needs prayer for anything in their life. In Jesus' name.
lift our hands all across this room one last time. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you that we can trust you. And Lord, once again, right now in this moment, as we walk into this week, Lord, let it be our, our heart's desire that you would teach us to pray, that we would take a step this week to begin or to go a little deeper or to better understand what it looks like to spend time in prayer. Lord, that we would be in your word this week. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity on Tuesday night to gather in this room for that specific purpose, to seek your face, to pray. Lord, give us wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard and give us courage to step out and do it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.